The folks will see what I mean by that in a moment, but with no pun intended. I pray this every time I preach, no matter where I am. Open up our eyes. Let us see what it is you want us to see. It's so important that we would see what it is you're trying to show us. We've opened up our hearts to you in worship. We've prepared ourselves for the presence of the Lord, for the working and moving of your spirit, and for the word of God to be planted in our hearts as a seed. So, Father, as the word comes, may it bring illumination to us. May it bring revelation to us. May we see what it is that you want us to. And we'll be quick to give you the glory and the honor and the praise for that, Father. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. If you have Bibles tonight, turn over to John chapter 9, and uh, we're going to mess around here for a while and see what kind of trouble we can get ourselves into. Uh, again, I'm thankful for the Word of God. How about you? Yeah. Sunday morning, we had, uh, we had a powerful uh, word from the Lord. Pastor Dana was given a, a message by the Holy Spirit, and uh, it was very powerful, right on, right on the money. I was back at the bookstore, and she was up on the front row, and uh, as soon as the Lord gave me the message, it was kind of a download and what it was that he wanted me to preach, uh, Jamie Kreitz came to me and said, Pastor Dana has a word from the Lord. And I said, she doesn't have to ask. Have her go and release it. And it was right in line with what the Lord was talking about. I said, well, this is going to work out just fine. You know, it's a little bit of an eerie feeling when you walk around the corner of the sanctuary and you have zero thoughts about what it is that you're going to say. But before I did, I said, Lord, I'm your mouthpiece. And let any man speak as an oracle of God. So these people showed up to hear something from you, not from me. So uh, you're on the hook. <laughs> and praise God, he's good for it. Amen? You know, I, I say this to you often, but uh, my job as a minister of the, of the gospel and the word of God is to make sure the devil's having a bad day. Amen? I heard one preacher say one time concerning ministry that our job as preachers, our job as Christians is to see God glorified, to see the church edified, to see the lost justified, and see the devil terrified. Amen. That's our job. That's our responsibility. Did you find John chapter 9? Praise God. Father, tonight, let that happen. Let the church bring you glory and honor and praise. Let the church be edified. Let the lost be justified. Let the devil be terrified. Put him on the run, Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 9, we're going to just start reading here. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. His disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, because he was born blind? Now, it's important for us to understand in the text, the day and age with, with this is being written, when this is being written, excuse me, it was, it was commonly believed that if uh, an infant um, was capable of sinning. And so if a child was born with a deform deformity or a deficiency, it was commonly believed that either the child sinned in the womb, which is crazy, uh, or the parents of the child sinned while the child was in the womb. And so God brought judgment uh, through deformities or deficiencies. And thank God that's not true. Amen. So they're asking, what happened? This guy's born blind. So something has happened Either he sinned when he was in the womb, or his parents sinned. And Jesus makes a statement that I think is pretty powerful. A lot of times it's misunderstood. But Jesus makes a very powerful statement. He said, neither. This guy didn't sin. This guy's parents didn't sin. That's not the thing that gets misunderstood. But that the works of God should be revealed in him. A lot of times people think, well, you know, this guy was born blind, so that way God could heal him. Eh. Wrong answer. The guy was not born blind by God, by the will or plan or purpose or sovereignty of God, so that way, how many ever years longer later, we don't know, this guy could be healed. That's not what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, this guy is blind. He was born that way. His, his parents didn't sin. He didn't sin. But what's about to happen is the works of God are about to be released in this young man is going to be healed, and we will stand here and give glory to God. Praise God for it. Amen. And so it says, I must work, verse 4, the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. 
As long as I am in the world, verse 5 is a powerful, powerful statement. You ought to know the I am statements of Jesus. I preached a sermon series on it. If you don't know them, get it. It will help you. I'm not trying to sell sermons. I'm trying to help you. But Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Praise God for that. It says, when he had said these things to his disciples, he spat on the ground and made clay with saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. Jesus spit on the ground, mixed the spittle, the saliva up with Dirt, it became clay. The word anointed there just simply means to rub in. He took the mud that he made, he rubbed it in the man's eyes. They probably were closed, but we don't know that. Nevertheless, you know, we think about how God created humanity. From the dust of the earth, God said, well, there's apparently something missing out on this. We'll just add a little bit more dirt. And so he does that, and he says to Jesus, says to this young man, go and wash yourself in the pool or the water of Siloam, which is translated sent, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. So it says that he did this, washed, and he came back seeing. Man, what a powerful, 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 powerful verse. He went he washed, so he, he went on the word of Jesus. He obeyed the commandment of the Lord, and he came back seeing. Praise God for that. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is this not the one who sat begging? I love, I love these guys. These guys crack me up a tad. He said, isn't this the one who sat begging? Some of them said, this is him. And others said, no, it can't be him. He can see. They said, well, he looks just like the guy. I mean, if that's not the body of Christ today, Larry, Moe, and Curly. And so the Bible tells us all the while he's standing there saying, guys, I'm the one. It's me. Hi. I can see now. He says, what? I am he, verse 9. Verse 10, it says, Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes opened? And he said unto them. You know, I was reading a modern translation of this account. I don't like to call uh, the Bible a story because it's not a story, it's an account. And I was reading a modern translation of this account. In this next verse, I love what it says. Verse 11, he said, He answered and he said, A man called Jesus. That's the New King James. The Passion Translation said, I met a man named Jesus. Boy, we could preach the rest of our lives on that phrase right there. I met a man named Jesus. How is it that you come seeing, Oh, I met a man named Jesus. How is it that God has brought you up and out of whatever you were in. Oh, I met this man named Jesus. Well, how is it that your body's been restored? How is it that your relationships are healed? How is it that you have peace in your mind? Last time I saw you, you were crazy like Nebuchadnezzar. I didn't know if you had feathers or fangs. I met a man named Jesus. Some of you are like, Nebuchadnezzar, feathers, fangs. Just, you'll, just look it up. Just Google it. <laughs> Lord. I met a man named Jesus. There's some pretty powerful things being said already. He says, I meant this man called Jesus, and he made clay and he anointed my eyes. And he said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And so I went and washed and I received sight. Then they said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought him who formerly was blind. Well, you got to circle formally. Praise the Lord for formally. They brought him who was formerly blind to the Pharisees. Now it was the Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened this man's eyes. We're going to continue reading tonight, but as we're talking about this, I just sense the Lord 
speaking to me. And so I want to talk to you in the same manner. Now, one of the most important things that we should do while we read the Bible is ask the text questions and wait for an answer. Ask the text questions. Here's one. Which one am I? Because in a moment in our story, again, I don't like to call it that, but in this account of a healing, we're about to see that the Pharisees, the religious crowd, are ticked, not a tad. In fact, they're about ready to throw this man and potentially his family out of fellowship in the community and remove them from their relationship. Now, we would think, who cares? God doesn't want big churches anyways. That, that's foolish. But that's not really what that would mean. What that would mean was you wouldn't be able to buy or sell anything in the community because you had no standing in it. That means you wouldn't be able to get a job because you have no standing in the community. You cannot marry because you have no standing in the community. You have been excommunicated, so your, your future as this blind man, you came out of bondage. The Pharisees warned those, if you follow Jesus, we'll excommunicate you and throw you out of the synagogue. And he's about to find himself wound up back into bondage. The only thing different is now he can see. But he's out of fellowship or potentially going to be. So this, there's, there's a real fear, and we'll, we'll address this in a moment. But which one am I in the story? We won't even get ahead of ourselves and talk about the Pharisees. How about this? Jesus didn't ask any questions. Jesus moved to do something. Am I of the disciple who says, Lord, how come this is happening? Now, I know that nobody in this room ever says that to God. That is obviously the rest of the folks that go to this church that are streaming tonight by Facebook, but no one here ever says, God, how come this is happening? Or worse yet, God, how come this isn't happening? See, I asked the text the question, which one am I? Am I the disciples who are trying to figure out why the guy's blind? Or am I like Jesus, moved with compassion and doing something about it? How about you? That's a question you ought to ask yourself. Which one am I? Am I the one who's trying to figure it all out? Now, I know for a fact, because I know some of you, because I pastor you, some of you. But that's a major hurdle that you need to overcome. How come? Why not? When? Is it ever going to? You want to figure it all out. I wonder how many times, we're just talking, just for a moment. I wonder how many times we've hindered the move and manifestation and demonstration of the person of Jesus Christ by the person of the Holy Spirit who indwells us and empowers us. I wonder how many times we've prolonged the move of God because we've wondered when and how and why not and how come. I'm, I'm preaching so good. Someone give me an offering real quick. I'll just give myself the offering. Thanks, Ken. Don't be lying in church now. In the New Testament, people lied at the offering and died. <laughs> that is the best sermon you could ever teach in Sunday school class. Teach it to the kids when they're young. Don't you lie about the offering, boy. People in the New Testament drop dead in church. What? Eyes this big. <laughs> Hi, Johnny. What'd you learn today? People die in church. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go to that church. I like it. Which one am I? You know, sometimes it's not really that big of a deal to us if we prolong our own deliverance or our own healing. Because at times, not all the time, but at times, sometimes, we get into a place where we feel kind of comfortable. We almost get used to it being this way. And so we say silly things sometimes. I won't repeat them. But we say silly things sometimes, like, you know, it's not that big of a deal, and there are people who have it worse than me, and things like that. So maybe it's not a huge deal for you personally if your miracle, your breakthrough, your deliverance, your healing, your whatever it is that you need isn't coming and is delayed because you're wondering, but what about somebody else's? 
What if God wants you to shut your mind down, stop trying to figure out how come or how come not, and help somebody else get theirs? Boy, I'm preaching so good right now. We'll just keep moving along because you like my sermon so much. It was a Sabbath day, verse 14. When Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes, and the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put clay on my eyes, I washed, I see. Do you understand? <laughs> right? In fact, I'll like it in a minute. This guy's fiery, I like him. He's probably from Morris. I know people from Morris that are a little fiery every once in a while. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Pause. Which one are you? See, they say to those who are there, let's get the picture again real quick. Jesus is walking by, sees a guy on the side of the road, he's blind, he says, hey bro, come here. Go wash in the pool of Siloam and come back. All right, got it. Went and did it, he came back seeing. Awesome. So then all these people are looking at him and saying, is this the same guy? He kind of looks like him. I'm not sure. And he's like, guys, hi, it's me. I've been here all along. And so then they say, what happened? <laughs> what happened to you? I'm, I'm in a man named Jesus. Oh, wow. Well, we got a problem. Why is that? Because you just broke the law. Well, I didn't wear my seatbelt, but I was in a hurry. You just broke the law. So they take him over to the Pharisees. See, in the context here, there, there's a whole community, community of people who are afraid of these religious rulers. That's why the context of Jesus in John 10, it's a continuation of a statement that Jesus makes. And he says, the thief doesn't come but to steal, kill, and destroy. He's talking about the Pharisees, contextually. But we know that that can be universal, and of course it's the devil, because all he does is lie and steal and kill and destroy. But these folks are terrified, and so they don't want to be found. Um, what's that word? Collusion. You ever heard that word before? They don't want to be found. They don't want to be found working with someone who could potentially be an enemy of the religious elect. So they take him to the Pharisees, and they say, tell him, tell him what you told him. Tell him what you told us. And so he says, well, what happened to you? Well, I see now. I was blind. Okay, what happened? Well, there's a guy. He's been on the ground, made clay, put it in my eyes, told me to go wash, and I came back seeing. And they said, well, this is a problem for us too. Your friends are good. So then they say, this guy cannot be from God. He doesn't even keep the Sabbath. Jesus said that God made the Sabbath for man and not man for the Sabbath, but we forget about that one. And so the people who took this neighbor to the Pharisee said, well, wait a minute. You, I mean, for real, you guys say that he can't be from God, but how could he do the thing he just did if he's sinful? Which one am I? Which one are you? Sometimes I've been around Christians, and no one here, this, not this church. But I've been around Christians, they get upset when someone else gets the miracle before they do. <laughs> you know why the world hates the church? Because we're stupid and we suck a lot. <laughs> I'm just being honest. That's prob I'm not trying to be crass. But a lot of times the world looks at us and says, you guys are no different than us, and you're going to try to tell us that we should be like you? We already are. We already devour one another and gossip about one another. And we already backbite and slander one another. And we already push somebody else down so we can get ours in front of them. So what do you mean? I already am like you. I'm also preaching better than your amen and again. So am I, am I uh, the person in the crowd who is not happy that God's touching my neighbor and not me? Or am I the religious guy who doesn't like the fact that God's using somebody else? It's 
someone said to me one time, why is it that you don't have a big problem with other people being used by the Lord? And I said, that is my job. It's my job. My responsibility to Jesus is to train you up to do the stuff I do. If I don't let you do the stuff I do, I'm failing you. But you know, a lot of times, lead leaders, pastors, what have you, there's strife and contention because God is working through somebody else and he's not working through me. So then we all want to look at, well, you know, how they dressed. What kind of blue jeans they wear. What kind of shoes they wear. See, Rosie's been around so long, she knows it. And all we can say, honestly, all we can say is, Lord, have mercy on us. We're so foolish sometimes. I'm probably not talking about anybody in this room, but we've all heard of people that may have had those defeating mentalities or mindsets. We're going to just keep moving in a minute. Which one am I? Am I the religious man who's mad and upset? Or am I going to be the one who stands up for the move of the Holy Spirit and says, how can you say that this person's bad? How can you say that this person is out of the will of God? How can you say that this person isn't walking with God when the miracle is the proof of the demonstration of God in their life? Now, I understand that God will work through even a donkey. I understand that. But that, by the way, only happened one time in our Bible. I used to say that I believe donkeys can speak. I see it every Sunday. But I don't say that anymore because that's not nice. And then I'd actually add the King James version of that word, and then people really didn't like that. But what happens when it's consistent and potent and it's not really flippant, but it's more the norm. See, it's not necessarily an endorsement of a lifestyle, but at some point it becomes, this person is walking worthy of the one that called them. So to some degree, it almost does become a bit of an endorsement because you're not going to get those assignments with the consistency and with the potency and with the regularity of God moving through you with the move of the Holy Spirit, the manifestation of healings, people being born again and filled with the Holy Ghost and set free. You're not going to have God using you to espouse and open up the Word of God to people. That is an endorsement because there's fruit on the life and fruit on the Word. So are we going to be the person who says, well, you know, I just don't think that a preacher should preach in blue jeans and a golf shirt. Or are we going to be like, I don't care who God uses. Why don't we grab some hands and dance and shout and jump for joy because God just caused this man who couldn't see to see. We get too concerned about looking at the package. Look at the, the, the vessel being used. And remember when we talked about limiting God and I talked about how we can limit the Father and how we can limit the Son and how we can limit the Holy Spirit in that, that portion of that, that uh, sermon series that we ministered on limiting God according to the Word of God, he says they, 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 they turned me to anger or wrath against them because they didn't listen to me, they didn't follow me. They didn't believe me. They fussed about God's man. They fussed about his plan. They fussed about the provision. They said, some miracle. You can make bread fall down from the sky. How about some meat? I love the fact that God literally buried them in quail. You want meat? We gotta be careful that we don't get so concerned. What if God is speaking through Nick and not Pastor Brian? That ought to happen. 
Nick has only been with me since forever. Even if on accident, he should have learned something. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I mean, you stick around long enough, you might even trip and fall into some knowledge. Amen. Are we at a place where we don't care? It doesn't matter to me, God. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Or are we upset and uptight? And it wasn't through me, so it was at the wrong time and the wrong place. Uh-oh. Moving right along. We're doing okay, I think. He said, this guy cannot be from God. He doesn't even keep the Sabbath. How can a man who is a sinner do these things, they said? And there was division among them. Hmm. They said to the blind man again, what did you say about him because... He opened your eyes, right? He said, well, I think he's a prophet. What, what do you say about him again? I mean, he's the guy that opened your eyes. Who, who do you think he is? I think he's a prophet. So the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind. So now they start calling the man a liar. That's crazy. So they called his parents and they said, you guys are going to have to answer for this guy. We think he's a liar. By the way, this is in the, this is in the church. This is in the Bible times day. This is their church. They're in church. So crazy. <laughs> God moves and you call the person he moved on a liar because you haven't seen him move before? Yikes. They go get his parents. So they get the parents. They said, is this your son? Uh, yeah, that's my son. Okay. You said that he was born uh, deaf? No, no, he was born blind. Yep, he's born blind. Okay. All right. Well, then I want to know how come he sees now. And they said, uh, we know that this is our son. Pretty positive he was born blind. By what means? He says, we have no idea how. We don't have any idea how he sees. I don't know. And how, did, how is it that this person opened their eyes? Don't know. Who was the person that opened his eyes? Don't know. And so then the parents, because they've seen it in the church, they throw their kid under the bus. <laughs> Ask him. He's old enough to answer for himself. In other words, don't you dare say Jesus, idiot. You're going to get us thrown out of this community? Hmm. That's an interesting concept. The parents throw the son who was born blind and just got delivered by Jesus. He has sight now. They know it's him because, you know, it's his parents. And they don't want to answer. Yes, they don't know, but it moved beyond that. Like, are we done here? This is my kid. He was born blind. Everybody in the neighborhood knows him. Can we leave? No, it's instead, why don't you ask him? We don't want to. And you say, well, how do you know that that's the case? Because it says it right here. They feared the Jews, verse 22. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he, that he was Christ, he would be put out. If anybody confessed that I'm going to follow him, so therefore his parents said, he's of age. Ask him, verse 24. So they asked him again, who was blind, and they said, give glory to God. We know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. And he answered and he said, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, that I was blind and now I see. Then he said to him again. I mean, they're just hammering this guy. In church. Don't miss it in church. We don't believe in miracles around here. Well, sorry, I got one. Leave. <laughs> you know the doctrine, never mind, never mind. That whole God doesn't do that anymore is completely fine until he does. Then what are you going to do? Oh, crap. We've been saying this for 150 years. Now what? Well, of course he's lying. 
the, the guy wasn't really sick. He wasn't really blind. He wasn't really dead. Anyway, moving along. You're excited about this, I can see. He says to them, how did he do it? What did he do to you? Verse 26. How did he do it? And he said, I told you already. You did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? And that, I know that this guy had to be in his early 20s. I know that this guy is a millennial. I'll bet everything I own on the fact that this kid is a millennial. Because he says, I've already told you you didn't listen. Why are you asking? Do you want to be his disciple too? I imagine his parents said, you guys just kill him. Let's go ahead, I don't, go ahead and throw him out. Do you want to be his disciple as well? Turn the page. They reviled him and they said, you are his disciple? Well, fine. We're Moses' disciples. Whoa. He says, we know that God spoke to Moses. And for this fellow, for this fellow, this guy's probably from World War II era. For this fellow, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, why? This is a marvelous thing. You do not know where he is from. Yet he has opened up my eyes. So which one are you? Which one am I? Am I the person who's trying to explain away? Am I the guy trying to argue with? Am I the guy trying to deny, denounce, refuse to believe? Or am I like that kid? Do you want to be his disciple too? That young man who's able to speak and answer for himself where he says, why is it that you don't know him? This seems like a problem to me. You're supposed to be the ruler guy and you don't know the guy who's opening up eyes. Then he says something even worse. Now, we know that God does not hear sinners. This is the guy. This is the young man. We know that God does not hear sinners. If anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, we know that he hears them. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone would have their eyes opened who was born blind. If this man were not from God, how could he do it? He could do nothing. They answered and said, you're completely born in sin and you're trying to teach us. And they said, cast him out. Crazy. I got through out of a church one time because I was at the altar worshiping God and praying in tongues. They come up to me and they said, sir, we don't do that here. And I said, don't do what here? Worship God? They said, no, we don't pray in tongues here. And I said, I'm sorry, would you like that to change? No, thank you. Okay, well, am I good to just do it on my own? Leave me alone? No, you're not. So what should I do? You should leave. Fantastic. Thank you very much. It's better than causing a scene. Cast him out. I can't get an answer, so just get him out of my face. Don't let anybody see him. Everything's about to come undone and unglued if he sticks around here. Just get him gone. Cast him out. 35, then Jesus heard that they had cast him out. When he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And the man answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said to this young man, for judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, are, you blind? are we blind also? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say we see, and therefore your sin remains. Jesus tells this young man who's just been excommunicated from a religious group, it's probably the best thing that ever happened to him, outside of meeting Jesus and becoming a seeing man. He tells him, you know, I came so that people who said that they're blind, who said that they needed me, could see. But in my coming, there are people like these Pharisees, these religious folks, that they say, with my self-righteousness, I can see. I don't need anybody's help. And Jesus said, they're blind to the truth. 
But think about what Jesus said at the very beginning to his disciples. I am the light of the world. I've come to shine. To reveal who God is, to reveal who I am, to reveal what God is doing in the earth. I'm the one promised from the very beginning. I'm the one who is the lamb crucified before the foundation or framing of the world. And yet those guys, as this young man said, why is it that you don't know him? From the beginning of time, no one ever born blind has been able to see. He does this. He can't be a bad guy. You say he's a bad guy. You want me to tell you who he is? I don't know who he is. All I know is I couldn't see. Now I can. The only thing that changed was he touched me. And what is it that they say? Get out. There's a lot for us to look at in this chapter. There's a lot going on. I want to encourage you tonight as we begin to close the service down. Don't limit God and put him in a box. Don't think that God can only work through a guy wearing a, shirt, a shirt and tie. That's not why I'm wearing a shirt and tie tonight, but that, don't think that God can't work through a woman or through a young person or through an old person. Or Don't think that God can't work through someone who's not extremely eloquent in speech and intellectual. Don't think that God can't work through someone who is extremely eloquent and intellectual. Don't, don't, don't limit God. Don't be like the religious crowd that all you do is you're wanting to tout your own self-righteousness. We're the sons of Moses. God spoke to Moses and we're his. Oh, well, Jesus told them one time before, you Abraham was, I am. They really did not like Jesus. I want to see God move. I want to see the light of Jesus Christ shine in the world. I want to see him shine in this church. I want to see him shine in us individually. I want to see him shine through us. It's not enough that he just shine on us. We have to go out and take him out and allow and cause him to shine on others and that people would see the light of the world. But I want to encourage you, as we, we stopped along the way, and we asked some questions, don't be like the disciples who get caught up in the how and the why. Be like Jesus. Be moved with compassion and release the power of God just like he did. Don't be like the neighbors who don't, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I absolutely do not believe it. I don't believe it. I was on the phone with my mom yesterday. It was enjoyable. And we were talking about someone from our past. I should rephrase that because that sounds negative, but it wasn't negative. She just said, I ran into somebody the other day, and I said, that's cool. And, you know, I wasn't thinking about the person she actually saw. I was thinking about that person's spouse. And the Lord just reminded me of this woman who was so, 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 so ill. So ill, given a death sentence. I mean, flat out ill. And we knew her. Knew her for quite a few years. She wasn't a heavy woman by any stretch of the imagination, but when it was about to be the end of her life, she was a very, very, very frail, thin woman. She could not eat anything. She was ill. Doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. So the best thing that they could tell her is, you're going to die. Oh, thank you. I, thanks for letting me pay you to tell me that. I could figure that out on my own. But anyway... I'm not anti-doctors, but, you know, when someone loses all the weight and can't eat anything, it's pretty obvious that they're going to die. It's my medical opinion that you're not going to make it. Thanks, Skipper. At that time, theologically, and I do not want to misrepresent, I don't necessarily believe that they were completely in line with this whole, you know, blabbing it and grabbing it stuff. Is that a fair assumption to say that? I wouldn't think that they were Pentecostal by uh, where they were attending church. and Don't know what they even believed about miracles. Don't know what they believed about Jesus. Don't know what their belief was. But I know that there was a person who was brought into Detroit. I actually was in that church service. So not only do I know this person personally, and I can see that she's alive today and not sick like she was. But I was in the church service at the Joe Lewis Arena, and I saw her give her testimony. I said, I know that woman. So this is an, a, a notable miracle that's undeniable. And she went 
And, you know, all else fails, we'll just go to church, see if it'll work. It's a pretty good concept. If all else fails, let's pray. Has it come to that? Should we? It's getting serious, they're talking about prayer. It must be real serious, they're talking about going to church. You know, the person that God used is not my favorite, don't like him. Won't name his name, doesn't matter. Not my cup of tea. Don't like what he, don't like him. Just there's not, there's no other way to say that. But I watched with my own eyes and heard with my own ears this woman give a testimony. And people have accused men and women of God who are used with miracles and signs and wonders that they stack the audience and they put fakers. Well, you can't fake this. I know her. I'm from the neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it looks like her, except for she's eating now, and she's living, and that's not supposed to happen. And I listened to her give a testimony. She said, all I know is, <laughs> sometimes that's enough, isn't it? All I know is, once I was blind, now I, all I know is, I don't know what happened. I don't know how it happened. I can't give you a theological Discourse on what took place supernaturally, spiritually. I don't get what happened. All I know was I was sitting there in a wheelchair and I've been given a death sentence and that is real. And I felt something like fire hit my body and start to burn throughout my entire body. But it didn't hurt. And I stood up out of that wheelchair and I said, I'm healed. And she was. To the glory of God the Father not to the glory of a human. And here I am in a church service that I didn't want to be at, listening to a preacher that I don't even like. We can get caught up in who it is and totally miss what it is that God might have for us. Be careful that you don't judge. You come in, you see someone at the door that you don't like, you say, well, church is going to be bad. How do you know? Because I can't stand that person greeting at the door. I know it without a shadow of a doubt. That in the usher's breath was bad. And not only that, they're playing that stupid song that I can't stand and some idiot standing up in front of me. What if someone else in this room needs that stupid song that you can't stand? Maybe somebody else is waiting on us to play that stupid song that you can't stand. And they've been putting faith to the Lord. I hope they play that stupid song that that person can't stand because that's the one I need to hear to get me up out of this pit, to get the anointing on me. Man, stop coming to church for you. This is called pastoring you. Some of you do not like it. You're squirming. My Lord, get him to stop. And I just keep smiling. I don't even know how to smile. I look creepy when I smile. You ever seen... I've seen babies cry and children run when Kent Burrell smiled at them. Be careful. Be careful. Because you can sit there and say, I have a pedigree. I've gone to church for 1,700 decades. This person just showed up. See that row right there? Bless God, that's my row. For real? Well, how about I just move it out of my building? We can get so territorial. What if the person sitting in your row is about to get touched with the Holy Ghost and you've been shunning him the whole entire time you've been here for 1,700 decades and God's been showing up every service saying, I just wish I could get your stupid head and your hard heart fixed so that way I could help you. Someone had the audacity to come in and sit in my chair or park in my spot. What happens if they needed it? Be careful that we don't get weird. Remember what I said earlier about the fact that the world thinks that we're stupid? And a lot of times I hate to have to agree with them, but the church sometimes is stupid. We do stupid things that are so petty and don't do anything to build the kingdom. We say, Jesus said he'll, that the world will know us by the way that we love one another. I can't stand you, you stupid. Why do you come here? I love you in Jesus' name, brother. Praise God. I'm so glad that you're in the church today. I'm just saying.
Has anybody at least heard of something sort of similar to this? All right, I just wanted to make sure. Lord, as, as the great Miss Rosie said, have mercy. We need it. I'm not being silly. I'm being real. We really need your mercy. We really, 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 we, we, we get it. We're dumb sometimes. We do stuff, stuff that's just so childish. We need your help. We need your help. Have mercy on us. Lord, when we do something like that, let us feel like blind Bartimaeus who cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me. That's my prayer, Father, in Jesus' name. We would release the light of the world. There are many different characters in this account of this miracle. We want to be the ones that were most like Jesus. And we need your help to do it. We need your mercy to do it. We need your strength. Help us get over ourselves and get over feelings that have been hurt or offenses. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you get, did you get any help tonight? You're welcome. Praise the Lord. We're going to do this quickly.